Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. My name is Al-Anud al Madi, a senior associate at the Office of Strategic Affairs at the Crown Prince Court in Abu Dhabi, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to day two of the Gavi Midterm Review Conference. Day one's theme had the title of the Gavi model. We talked about the unique model of the Alliance in the context that is constantly changing to ensure sustainable results. And yesterday evening, you had a glimpse of the UAE culture and tradition and have enjoyed the interactive innovation workspace. Today, we will reflect on Gavi turning 18, focusing on the results it has achieved while it has matured as an organization. Gavi has come of age, establishing a clear and strong identity. At the same time, we can now say that after 18 years, Gavi has raised a healthy generation that has the opportunity to unleash their full potential. By the end of 2018, Gavi will have immunized 700 million people, helping to save 10 million lives in the world's poorest countries since the Alliance's inception in 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may already know, here in the UAE, this year, 2018, is the year of Zayed. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, the founding father of the UAE, had a vision. And at the top of his priorities was always the people, their well-being and their development in the UAE and beyond. And having the Gavi conference hosted here in the UAE at the end of the year of Zayed is befitting to honor his humanitarian spirit that lives within us and manifests in the actions of our leadership. Our first session for today is empowering the next generation. This session will provide a reflection on the road ahead. Over the past 18 years, we have worked together to, ra to raise a healthy generation. Now, we need to create a sustainable path into the future to secure the next generation. This session reflects on how a young nation, the UAE, and a young organization, Gavi, have worked and continue working together for a sustainable future for the next generation of adults to enter the world. Please allow me to welcome our speakers for this session. Her Excellency Reem Al Hashmi, Minister of State for International Cooperation, and Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Uyuela, Chair of the Gavi Board. Moderating this session is Zain Virgi, founder and CEO of Zain Virgi Group in the US. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Since its inception in Davos 18 years ago, Gavi has already protected a generation from infectious disease. We're now here to spend some time to really reflect on the progress Gavi has made since Berlin in 2015 toward empowering the next generation. So I'd like to invite to kick us off Her Excellency Reem Al Hashemi, Minister of International Cooperation for the UAE, to start with some of her thoughts and reflections. What does empowering the next generation mean to you? Thank you very much, Zain, and good morning to everybody, and welcome once more to Abu Dhabi uh, for this really very important um, meeting of the minds. Empowering the next generation um, is, from our perspective, about giving them the tools, but also the responsibility and the opportunity to shape what that future is going to look like. I think everybody talks a lot about the need to have the next generation involved and engaged. And I think one of our biggest challenges is how do you move away from a sense of apathy to a sense of a true ability to shape your own future. 
a lot of what we've done here in the Emirates um, surrounds or, uh, or kind of um, revolves around ensuring that each individual feels that they have, again, not just the opportunity to change, but also the responsibility to change. And this is very much linked to our commitment towards the sustainable development goals, because everybody hears about the 2030 goals, but they seem to be, quote, far away from where we're sitting here in 2018. They seem to be something that is in New York, um, in UN capital headquarters, but that is not the reality. We will not achieve our SDGs if we don't all feel a sense of urgency about getting to those SDGs. And that sense of urgency can only happen if one also believes that they are part of realizing SDG 3, SDG 1, etc. So for this generation, I think, given all of the challenges that millennials face and given how fast-paced this environment is to really ensure that they have the opportunity and the responsibility to be able to shape their own destiny and that it is theirs to own is a really powerful tenant of what we've been trying to do here in the Emirates. What encourages you the most? There's a lot of optimism out there. Despite a looming negativity that we often see, there are some really powerful, great stories of success. And I think our, our responsibility, or our ethos has to be, how do you replicate those positive, progr progressive stories? How do you ensure that you continue to be able to cultivate that so that you see it in so many other places as well? In a, in, a, in a sense here, there's no option other than to be optimistic. Uh, we, we have to, otherwise the, the path forward would be walking down um, a path of negativity and, and pessimism, and that's also not who we are as a people. So we sort of want to look at things with um, a renewed sense of challenge. Certainly being optimistic, I think, on a personal level is actually harder than being pessimistic because you have to always elevate above and, and try to keep doing more and keep doing better, which is, I think, something Gavi is very good at as well. Um, but that sense of uh, need to progress need to excel um, and desire to be more and be better is, um, is really where we're coming from. Ngozi Okonjawala is the Gavi board chair. How do you see it in, 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 when you look to the future and you look to the next generation? Thank you. Hel oh, yeah, it works. Um, uh, th thank you, uh, Zain. I think I want to follow very closely on, on what Her Excellency just said. Um, it's very easy for us to become overly pessimistic in the present environment we're in, where you wake up every day with uncertainties, both in the political and economic environment. But I think that for the next generation, we need to constantly remind of the important achievements that have been made that are positive. And certainly in the realm of poverty, uh, we've managed to bring millions of people out of poverty over time. In terms of health, we are living longer. Uh, we, we, we have uh, mastered some technologies. And that brings us to immunization and, and, you know, to vaccination that help us to live longer. So for me, when you talk about empowering the next generation, it means equipping them, as Her Excellency said, first with the basic tools with which to survive. And that's where we, as an organization, Gavi, um, you know, equip them with what will make them into healthy adults that can contribute in a productive manner uh, to their countries, to their generation, to the world. And on top of that, I think empowering them, bringing them into the conversation is very, very important. If you want to empower youth, they need to have a voice. So we constantly need to ask ourselves to what extent, and I do hope that in this session later today, we are going to have the voices of youth, we are going to hear from them. Bringing them in is part of the empowerment. You're both at the forefront of seismic shifts uh, that you're observing that are happening around the world today. How does Gavi adapt? Well, there, there are um, a, a lot of shifts. Uh, we can look at long-term trends, 
um, for example, in demographics in countries. Some of the countries we work in have some of the youngest generations, large birth cohorts that have to be immunized. We have, uh, we have um, shifts in terms of climate change uh, that may bring diseases, either exacerbate what we have now or you know, bring future epidemics that we don't know about and we have to, uh, to think about that. We have conflicts and fragile situations which leads to large migrations and movements. These are all things in which we are living now, may live in future. And uh, Gavi has to be flexible uh, to be able to deal with some of this. Now, we also have to be you know, mindful to make sure we don't lose our core mandate in terms of delivering uh, routine immunization for our children all over the developing world. But for instance, in fragile situations, we are well equipped to try to help those countries that, where people are very vulnerable and moving. And we've done doing that in Yemen, uh, in Syria, uh, in Myanmar, um, you know, some other situations where we, we have that, the, the, the fragility that shows up. Even in places, in northern Nigeria, for example, parts of the Sahel, we, we've also tried to, to work on that. Um, so I think, to, cut, to, to summarize, Gavi has to deliver on its core mandate, but it also has to be flexible to be able to serve the world in those situations where uncertainties arise. Excellency, in what ways do you think Gavi needs to be more flexible? It's a really tricky question. <laughs> The chair is sitting there, <laughs> Seth Berkeley is sitting over there. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the best possible audience. <laughs> well, let me, before I answer that, talk a little bit about the importance of being nimble. Um, and I think that's where, that's where Gavi, and, and maybe by extension I can say that's where the UAE has some of its strengths. It's its ability to adapt to changing environments. I think the... The, the biggest danger is for us to get stuck, stuck in our success or stuck in our challenges. Um, if we aren't able to, to rise above and continuously look at new ways of doing things better and more effectively, uh, then we would quickly uh, run into trouble. What Gavi could be doing more of, uh, which is um, something that I we've actually had a bit of a discussion around, is let more people know about what Gavi does so that if at the very least they help inspire other types of Gavis out there. So it's not only for people to know about Gavi, but people to understand the adaptability and the nimbleness of Gavi's um, sort of laser focus on results and laser focus on ensuring that those KPIs and that those results are replicated in other places. I've been personally inspired by their approach to things. I've been personally inspired by their incredible success. I mean, when you say 700 million people have been immunized, and Dr. Berkeley yesterday told us when we were meeting with His Highness, that is equivalent to every person under the age of 18 in all of the continent of Africa and all of the Middle East. To get a sense of the scale, that's how many people have gotten immunized. That's how many people who are now going to be able to live longer, but not just live longer, but live better. Live more healthy, more productive, and more able to contribute positively to their society. And I, I believe very strongly that when you are surrounded by entities that speak of such progress, that speak of such drive, such grit, such excellence, it inspires you to try to adopt some of those tenets as well. I'd love to see more types of organizations out there that, as Ngozi always says, wants to get themselves out of a job. Gavi's mission is to not continue to be around in the next several decades. You don't hear that very often from many places. On the raising, uh, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. yeah. I also wanted to say, to add to this, that on the flexibility and adaptability for the future, one of the things we must also look at is um, the alliance and its skills. You know, so making sure that we have the skills working with our, our governments to be able to deliver on whatever our mandate is. 
So we need to be nimble to do that, um, to adapt and adjust. How do, you, how do you do that more effectively? Well, I mean, that's, I think that's the beauty of this. Because it's an alliance, we've got WHO, we've got UNICEF, we've got uh, the private sector, we've got civil society, that each part of the alliance has different skills that it brings to the table. And what we need to do is to make sure that it leverages these skills to the advantage of the alliance. So it's not, I'm not talking about, say, the Gavi Secretariat alone, but each part of the alliance, making sure they are honed. So we, if we have to deal with a different situation, we maintain flexibility with, within the alliance to deliver. Her Excellency mentioned letting more people in the world know about Gavi's great work. Um, Dr. Ngozi, let me start with you first and then have Your Excellency's thoughts also on the disinformation campaigns uh, that are out there about, uh, and, and you know, the, why vaccinations don't work, the anti-vaccination conspiracy theories. How is Gavi going to battle this? Zain, uh, it's so interesting because this was a question that arose at our last board meeting. And there I shared a story, which I, I will also share here, a small anecdote. I was in London giving a speech at a totally unrelated uh, event for Mercy Corps. Um, and after giving, but I was introduced as the chair of the board of Gavi. And a woman stood up in the audience, this is in London, and said to me, it wasn't about what I talked about, but she said, you were introduced as the chair of the board of the Global a a Vaccine Alliance. She said, in my school, there are parents who refuse to vaccinate their children, um, and, and they believe that vaccines, uh, you know, do harm. What is your organization doing about it? So I was completely taken aback. And, and this is an anecdote. So I'm saying that to say that this information campaign, I mean, we should not overstate its presence. Uh, uh, most people still believe that immunization uh, is good and vaccination is good for their children, but it's not just even in, it's in developed countries that we're beginning to see the emergence of this UK, Italy, um, other countries. It's in developing countries where we have this. And the question we were asking ourselves is, what is Gavi's role in this? Does it have a comparative advantage to go out there and try to deal with this disinformation campaign? Or are there other organizations that we are allied with who are better equipped? And it's a question that we've not yet answered as a board. Obviously, we cannot sit with our hands folded, so we're thinking about it. But I think we may have to draw on others to help us fight that. Excellency, what are your views? I think we also live right now in the age of misinformation and uh, an anti-vaccination campaign is just one symptom of this, of this larger uh, predicament that we're in. As connected as we all are with one another, uh, there, that has also allowed for um, opportunities or vacuums for um, misinformation to take place, for uh, lies that are disguised as truths, truths that look so truthful that one would assume that it is the truth. And the many different versions of the truth are now uh, taking shape in different ways. I think as we, we, we need to we need to move from information and facts to real knowledge. Um, because you'll always have a counter narrative to anything you put forward. And so continuing to be advocates of the importance of immunization, of the importance of healthy and stable communities um, is, is not just going to happen accidentally. It's going to demand constant, persistent, determined, nonstop. Um, the same effort you put in immunization has to be a similar effort, if not more, in ensuring that that exercise can continue to happen. I'm just, uh, sorry, one, one uh, added point. I'm noticing this massive flashing red light that says we're out of time. If you allow me, Ngozi, could we both pull rank and extend our session for a little bit longer? Because I, I, I think we just got started. So if the organizers would allow maybe another five, seven minutes, if that's not too much to ask, and if the audience doesn't mind listening to us a little bit longer. 
Um, your Excellency, you, you can yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Can we pull rank, pull. you and I? It's your show. <laughs> you can definitely no, pull no. rank. It's our show. It, we all have to want to do this together. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for that. It's always a pleasure to, to have more time than less. Uh, as a moderator, you're always looking at that flashing zero and uh, sweating. Um, what are your expectations of today? Let's, let, let, let's set up the day and, and see what are, what are the priorities that we really all need to be grappling with that you would like to see results? So yesterday evening, we, we came with some pretty incredible milestones. And today is equally, if not more important, in ensuring that we take these um, very important steps to replicate further. I don't think our interest, neither the UAE's nor Gavi's, is for sort of one big headline. I think what we are always focused on is how do you continue to push the train of progress forward? And the whole point of the MTR and why we as the Emirates has been, have been interested in hosting the MTR is because as much as it allows you a moment of celebration, it demands from you important reflection about how you're going to do it better. Because the status quo is not enough. Because we cannot be complacent enjoying the success. We have to demand of ourselves and of each other better and more because the world around us is changing and because the challenges continue to grow. And so how do you balance, and I think you do this quite well already, the success, the celebratory hug, the clapping, but then say, okay, this is a midterm review, and therefore it demands that necessary thought and attention about moving forward. And, and a big part of moving that train forward and, and changing the status quo, uh, Dr. Ngozi, is innovation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what Gavi is doing in this space, uh, leveraging uh, innovation and technology to be more effective in, in achieving its goals, and what kind of innovative partnerships in the technology space might you like to see? Well, first, let me just second what uh, Excellency Minister Rim has said, that I hope when we leave uh, this uh, place after the midterm review, we would all at least have a shared sense of what Gavi has been able to do well and what it hasn't been able to do well. A very balanced assessment, you know, whilst, as you said, acknowledging whatever results we have positive, uh, positively, but also how do we complete our mission and the pledges we made in Berlin in 2015 and then move into the next period with all the challenges that are coming. So if we can all live here with a clearer sense of what we've achieved, what we need to complete, and what are the emerging challenges, that would have been an, uh, an accomplishment. And of course, part of, of, the, of all that, of what we've achieved and what we hope to move into the future with has to do with the innovation you raised. It was very exciting for me last night when we were in the innovation space. You know, my feet were hurting and I was complaining, but I forgot most of it. You know, when we're walking around as women with high heels, uh, and, and I know many of us were feeling this, you know, but I forgot all about it because each time I got to a station, there was something so exciting to share. And, and that is what, to me, makes Gavi very exciting. So we had all these things about how do you help frontline workers to do more. Much of what I saw could help us uh, in our health system strengthening space. Because when you say that you're trying to make frontline workers work more efficiently by getting more information. So we had a lot of people, you know, with digital ability for digital, digitalization of information, uh, training of the frontline worker. You know, so those who go to do the vaccination, which is the basic platform, if you want to have a strong universal health system or basic health system, you have to start with you know, how do you vaccinate your children? How do you have immunization? So all those innovations that help us to collect information better prompt the parents to be able to send the child for whatever needed vaccination and even give, equip them to train themselves, you know, with some modules to see whether they're doing things right and detect whether this child, because when you come to a child, it's not only about vaccinating, it's a whole child. What else is happening with this child? Do they have a fever that is unexplained? Is there something else, an ability to grasp that? We have these technologies, we saw them yesterday, that will enable us improve that. 
So that's exciting to me. I hope we can take that into the future. We saw the launch of the drones, and this again was very exciting. We, you know, in Rwanda, they were launching live drones that were flying and delivering blood, delivering me medication, delivering vaccines, and so on and so forth. And three or four countries have signed up to do this. This is the future to me because reaching coverage and equity, some of those places where we need to reach geographically are quite difficult. In a country like Rwanda that has mountains, you don't have, can build roads everywhere. How do you deliver what you need to those frontline workers? So I don't want to go on and on because I love technology, you know. We even talked about using blockchain you know, to, to enable some of our activities in future, and I think the German government has signed on to work with us. So, Zain, I really see technology as enabling us to be more flexible, more responsive in reaching our goals in future. Excellency? I couldn't agree with that more. Technology is the greatest game-changing, enabling factor of our time and it can either work to our disadvantage or it can work to our advantage. And we need to ensure that we use the elements of it that help us get to our end objective. If we constantly review to challenge the status quo, and if we constantly reassess if what has been working needs to be re-looked at, then we can capitalize on new technologies and we can capitalize on delivering more effectively. You know, uh, you guys all, uh, all are aware that the UAE government has a minister dedicated for youth, a minister dedicated for artificial intelligence, a minister dedicated for happiness and well-being. These are the themes we believe very strongly of the future. And we're trying to go ahead with these types of portfolios in government to make sure that the population isn't fragmented from what the government is trying to do. And if we continue to focus and continue to keep our eye on the end goal, and I started by talking about SDGs, and I want to sort of end my commentary on that as well. It is the only framework that unites all nations and communities of the world as of now. And therefore, it gives us significant momentum to be able to collectively address the calling of our time. Our challenge as, as this generation is how do you make the SDG goals relevant and relatable to the average public, to students, to businessmen, to farmers. They should not feel that these SDG goals have been formulated uh, in vacuum of what their own aspirations are. And I believe that also here technology can play and digital platforms can play a very significant role in bridging that distance between advocates and policy and between everybody else. Because at the end of the day, policy actually does sit at the heart of serving communities by and large. Just a couple more quick thoughts here. Dr. Ngozi, to make all of this happen, political will sits at the, at the, at the core of all of this. How, how, how do we make sure that these priorities happen in spite of other global or, or national interests uh, and priorities, and that what we're talking about here today is actually put front and center? Well, you know, you like this subject of political will, Zane, because we <laughs> talked about, I mean, we're, we're sitting in a country that epitomizes political will. So um, I really am proud of what the UAE is trying to do here and the way they are trying to do it. And I think what we need to do is leverage two things. To generate political will, people have to know the results of what you're producing. I mean, people do not act unless they believe that something, uh, you know, positive. So can we, and this comes to Her Excellency's point, how do we get people to know more about the positive results that Gavi is generating. Without blowing our own trumpet too much, that's not what we're talking about. But when people know that you can reach at scale 700 million people, this morning, for instance, I had a meeting with the vice uh, chairman of MasterCard on the issue of this scale 
you know, imagine if we can reach so many people with immunization, then we could maybe have a digital platform on which to include them for even finances, education, other things. So we need to generate, create information that we are about results. Two, we need to be very clear about the economic benefits. We all know the humanitarian benefits, but what about the economic benefits of what we're doing? Many political leaders may not know those figures we've quoted so much. 50 billion has been generated in benefits from this uh, immunization, from the platform of what Gavi has done. Uh, the rate of return we talked about yesterday. So that's one way, getting out the news. Um, or, uh, about what has been done. Um, I, I think in, in addition to that, we need to um, somehow, for political will to take place, we need to get to the grassroots. You know, so we mustn't forget that. It's good to work with leaders at the top. But having with us the youth, the women, the people in the communities who know what we are doing, politically, they will demand more of it. So I think those two approaches is what we need. Excellency, please offer a final thought uh, for this session uh, and, and some of the most important things that you'd like us to keep in mind. I'd like to um, just close by thanking everybody for, for being here and certainly for believing in the importance of what Gavi does and seeing that related in what their own respective countries and governments are doing as well. I also know that there are a number of people from the private sector here with us, and I commend them for taking not only an interest, but an engaged, responsible approach towards this. And it is very important, as in, in one of my remarks yesterday, um, I spoke of how we need to redefine partnership. To be able to tackle the challenges of our time, we're going to need to be creative and innovative and flexible about who we partner with and how we partner with them. Uh, otherwise, we're again going to just get stuck um, in the conundrum of the challenges. I'd also like to, at the very end, um, mention the importance of looking to the future with optimism and hope. We cannot um, succumb to uh, disinformation or negativity. The future is ours. Uh, it is ours to shape and to own. Uh, and as long as we recognize that when we do that collectively, we are all stronger and better for it, and the future is brighter for it, uh, then we're at a much better place. A personal note of gratitude to you, Zain, who I've known for many years, and certainly to Ngozi, who is a bit of a mentor to me as well, and to everybody who has taken of their time, who's flown in from very far places to share in this collective community of the willing, if, if I could say, uh, to really push forward for empowering the next generation. Thank you so much, Excellency. Really appreciate your inspiring words and your continued strong commitment to Gavi. Thank you. <laughs>